Well, welcome to Taking the Tradition On. Um, it's a series of conversations with exceptional people about traditional oral storytelling. There probably will be some stories that sneak their way in, but it is mostly an evening of in conversation, an evening of discussion. Um, we are currently on series four. I can't believe we've got this far through. Um, the lots of amazing conversations in the past from the previous series that you can catch up with. They're all free. They're all on the YouTube channel, Taking the Tradition On. So go and have a peruse when you have time. Um, but now we're on series four, which is Words in the Works. Um, and all of these conversations are about applied storytelling. So storytelling in different spheres of work. So we've already explored storytelling and archeology, span storytelling with refugees, um, storytelling in education and with libraries and a host of other subjects. But tonight is gonna to be telling the world about story. Um, all previous episodes say up on the YouTube channel. And if you if you enjoy them, please do subscribe to the channel, help me keep it going. And as always, I would like to thank my fabulous patrons who really helped to make this happen. And a special hello to Nana. I'm not sure if Nana's made it in yet. I think she might be having to watch it on the catch up. But Nana, whenever you get to watch it, you are welcome, my latest patron. And if you'd like to join her and my other patrons, then feel free to come and find me on patreon.com slash Amy Douglas. So, Ah, uh, Nana is it? Welcome, Nana. Welcome. Um, my guest tonight is a BBC World Service broadcaster and journalist. He's got two books out, um, Tangier, From the Romans to the Rolling Stones, and The Last Storyteller, um, Tales from the Heart of Morocco. Um, he's also the creator of the House of Stories, which is a fantastic online archive um, of stories from all around the world and storytellers from all around the world and that is also freely available on YouTube. So welcome, please go mad on the chat, put your virtual hands <laughs> together for the wonderful Richard Hamilton. Welcome, welcome to Taking the Tradition On. Thank you Amy, so it's an honour and a privilege, thank you. Well, we're very delighted to have you here. And uh, so you are, you're, um, you wouldn't describe yourself as uh, an oral traditional storyteller, which is kind of the, the heart of what we do here at Taking the Tradition On. And we don't expect you to be, so don't worry. <laughs> you're a journalist, um, you're a foreign correspondent. Um, so I think you must have always been interested in stories and, and interested in, in, in people and, and narrative to have arrived as a journalist and a, and a correspondent. But I don't think sort of traditional story was part of your your early life, was it? No. So I mean, like like most kids, I liked re I loved reading. I'd read Tolkien, and you know, when I was younger, there were people like Ursula Le Guin, and uh, you know, so the whole bit. And uh, so I loved reading. I, I never really thought about storytelling. And then the more I with the journalism, the more I got into it, the, the more I realised that broadcast journalists are storytellers, really. Uh, they're just using modern technology. but And radio is even more uh, storytelling because it's just an oral experience and it's very intimate. So when I first got into journalism uh, in local radio, one of my bosses said, radio is better than TV because it has the best pictures. And I thought that was quite profound because radio is very intimate and, you know, you can be driving along in your car late at night with the rain lashing on your windscreen and you do feel it's just you and the presenter of the programme or the interviewee or whatever. So I think it is a form of storytelling, but I didn't realise that until sort of retrospectively I started thinking about it. I, I think it definitely is a form of storytelling, not not traditional stories, but those kind of those everyday stories and those places where stories start and and personal stories and that that moment of empathy and of seeing it's a window into other people's worlds and other people's lives. So I can see that you kind of was maybe receptive to it. But when when was your first encounter with traditional storytelling? 
So it was in Morocco. So just to sort of set the scene, I actually trained as a lawyer and then had an early middle life crisis and decided I didn't want to carry on photocopying and proofreading and checking mortgage documents. I wonder why. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and things things went to a head one day because I was working for a solicitor's firm in Bristol after I qualified. And I wasn't I wasn't a very enthusiastic lawyer. So they put me with this senior partner so that I would share a room with him. And uh, every sort of evening at about six o'clock, he would pack up his briefcase and say goodbye. And then one day, uh, it was in the winter, and it was about six o'clock, so it was dark outside. And I could hear him getting his briefcase together, because I was sitting sort of facing the window, and he was to one side. And I thought, bugger this, I'm not going to say goodbye to you. You're, you're, you're a bit of an ass. Uh, so instead, I could hear his briefcase being shut. And then I heard a flick of a switch, and I was plunged into darkness. And I took this as a sign that uh, this was the nadir of my legal career, and that I should move on. So after that, I um, applied to journalism school, and then I worked in local radio. Um, so just that whizzing through very quickly, uh, I, I got this posting in Morocco, and I met a, a step up there from local local radio to suddenly go. Yeah, maybe country. I should fill in the gaps a bit. So I'm going to be I, a foreign spent... correspondent and just. <laughs> I spent three years in local radio and then I got a job for the World Service because I'd travelled around. After I um, left the law, I went travelling around uh, on a, one of these uh, buses around Africa and that sort of fed my enthusiasm. I thought, oh, this is what I want to do. I'd always like writing. I'd like taking photographs. I'd love travelling. And I thought, no, I'd, I'd like to be a foreign correspondent. I don't really want to just be an Alan Partridge doing double yellow line schemes in Norfolk or, uh, you know, Norwich town centre or something. I want to, you know, I want to be somewhere exotic. So I travelled around in Africa. And then after that, I got into the World Service and spent about seven or eight years being a producer on programmes. And then I took a bit of a plunge and I went and made a documentary in Tanzania because I was doing a master's at SOAS in African studies. And I was doing this part time uh, while working at the World Service. And then my tutor at SOAS was an expert on witchcraft uh, in Tanzania. So I went and did, I went with him on one of his field trips and I came back and I did this documentary about witchcraft in Tanzania. So that seemed to persuade the bosses that that I was quite good at getting the story from somewhere and painting pictures with words and being a storyteller, I suppose, but in a journalistic way. So that helped me get uh, these foreign jobs. So the first one was a, a stringer in Madagascar. And then the second one was a freelance reporter in Cape Town. And the last one was a posting in Morocco as a correspondent. So when I was in, when I started there, I met a Spanish uh, web designer and I said, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I'm, I'm working with UNESCO and we're recording stories from storytellers in Marrakesh and we're going to put them on a website so we can preserve them for the future. And I thought that's a fantastic uh, idea for a report. So I went down to Marrakesh and found uh, an old storyteller in the square, the main square. It's called the Jamal Fanar. And I worked with, uh, he was actually a tour guide, but he was sort of multilingual. And he was my translator and interpreter. He was called Ahmed. And we got together and uh, I remember it was December 2006. And we sat in the square. It was bright sunshine. It was quite cold. And this old man in his 70s. Uh, telling stories in Moroccan Arabic called Darija, and then the odd word of Berber. And he was surrounded by about half a dozen very devoted fans who sort of eat fairly old uh, audience. And they sat on these cardboard, bits of cardboard on the cobblestone, not the cobblestone, sort of paving stones of the square in a circle. And they listened to every word. And I recorded uh a bit of him I interviewed him and that became the sort of my first encounter so I did a BBC report about the endangered art of storytelling and how UNESCO wanted to try and save them by using technology and was it 
was it a slow burn or was that kind of one of those spark moments? No, I think it was it was a spark moment, but I had no idea where it would lead to. I mean, I was absolutely amazed by the fact it felt like I'd gone back a thousand years. It feels like time travel uh, that I was just struck by, you know, because we live in such a complicated world and we've made our lives so complicated. And even now we're on Zoom and we're adjusting our levels and everything. But um, there's something very pure and simple and eternal about a storyteller I mean I don't I don't need to tell you this and I don't need to tell the audience because a lot of you are storytellers but there's something it's just sort of quite liberating to get rid of all the modern crap and go back in time and have that intimate experience of the story going from the mouth of one person into the ear of another and I remember thinking this is like what it must have been in the Sahara Desert when people uh camped at night amongst the dunes and lit a fire and the camels went to sleep and then they told stories or in the mountains of the atlas uh amongst the berber people because the tradition's very very old in morocco pre-islamic or even cavemen you know or cave women uh they would have sat round a fire and told stories so there was something in that encounter that just sort of i thought this is amazing that people are being paid they're passing a hat round to tell stories i just thought that was fantastic I, I had no idea that that still existed in the 21st century so i felt i was sort of going being sucked back a thousand years and so it was quite a profound experience but then the sort of other things that followed were sort of more slow burner you know so i didn't know that i was going to write a book i had no idea that i'd end up meeting storytellers going to festivals um creating this website so that you know th th those things evolved almost without me being in control of them it's really interesting for me because the way you describe it you, you did fall in love with it as a journalist rather than as a listener there's it, it's kind of that outside eye voyeuristic kind of you fell in love with the fact that the storytelling still existed rather than going <gasps> this is an amazing story and I'm in the story and I'm, I'm in love with kind of listening to stories. It's kind of a slightly different way of falling in love with certainly than I, I came to it, but I don't know if that first story was being translated or if it was just, you know, you were all, it, it was all not in your language. I, I don't know how good your Dorita is. I mean, I, I think, you know, a few words, but it's not, you're not flip, you know, mm. you're needing a translator. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, I had my sort of big confession is well, first of all, I didn't speak Arabic, so I used Ahmed as my translator and interpreter. And the other thing that I'm really ashamed to say, but I say this in my book, is that I was I was in sort of journalist mode, like you say, and I had my we had mini discs in those days, but anyway. Uh, and I was looking at it and I was looking at the batteries and the batteries were getting a bit low. And I had uh, you know a, a, an hour on the mini disc and i'd recorded some questions and i was in i was a bit stressed you know so i i was in journo mode and then i said to him oh can uh, to to the old man who was called um Moulay mohammed el jabri i said to him via ahmed the interpreter oh can you tell a story but i wasn't really listening because i was in i was checking the recording levels ahmed kept trying to steal the microphone off me and i was sort of <laughs> holding it back and it was all a bit chaotic. And then there were sort of other people coming and going and, and people gathering around saying, what's this, you know, Western guy doing? And so it was all it was all a bit stressful. I wasn't able to just sit back and enjoy the story. And then so after about 10 minutes and it also he was very slow. He was going once upon a time in Marrakesh. And I thought, oh, Jesus, you know, how long have you have I got? You know, my batteries are running out and I don't really have time and, you know, I've, there's so many things I need to do and to think and what the next question is going to be. So I said, enough of this. <laughs> and so uh, we, I just cut it. I said, you know, time out. And so the poor guy, you know, he's sort of midway through a sentence. His mouth was open. And I was in impatient Western Brit, uh, you know, uptight journalist mode. And I said, stop it. We won't bother with this because... It had been very slow, and then it was further delayed by the fact 
that he would pause after a minute and then Ahmed would say, oh, he said there was an old man in Marrakesh, you know, and I go, oh, you know. So so we basically cut it short and that was my first recording, but we I only had like 10 minutes of it. And then, as I say in the introduction to the book, I then found other storytellers. I came back to research the book because I finished my posting as a journalist, but I came back uh, to research the book and I met other storytellers and there was no sign of this Moulay Mohammed. And then, um, and then uh, Ahmed, uh, sort of after, towards the end of all my research, Ahmed said, oh, look, I've, I've managed to find Moulay Mohammed and he's this sort of really old guy who was in really bad health. And we sat down and I was more patient and we recorded this story and it's the first one in the book and it's called The Red Lantern. So it's very sort of emotional for me. And that's the one that everybody loves. And I've heard it called different things and people have come up to me and said, oh, I've, that's an Egyptian story or that's an Indian story or oh, it's there isn't a lantern in the Indian one, but there's a crown or something like that. So there's different variations um so it is recorded and and you know there's there's a, a museum in marrakesh that's devoted to storytelling so i'd love to give some of the archive recordings to them i think that sounds like the, the perfect place then is is the red lantern one of the stories you thought you might share with us um i could do it's a little bit a little bit long uh but it depends what people's appetite is well, it's not it's not super long. I'd say it's about seven minutes. Is that good? It wasn't. It, er, it's up originally. to you. It depends which one you want to share. You can share another one of us. I've got lots and lots of questions that I want to ask you. Yeah, we can let we can uh, let people read actually, it. Actually, no. Hell. To hell with it. Let's have the red lantern because I built I I built it up. So we <laughs> might as well have it. It wasn't I wasn't what I was going to read, but because there's a couple of shorter ones, but this it's only. In I like the book. to throw people in at the deep end. Yeah, it's only um, about three or four pages. So if, I'll, I'll, shall I read it now then? Go for it. Okay. So it's the and first is, one. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is obviously not quite in the storyteller's words because no. it's translated and then you've had to sort of curate that translation. Exactly. I mean, that was I, that's a question that I often get asked about, you know, do you speak Arabic? How accurate is the translation? But you're right, this has gone through several stages. Uh, it, it came out of Mulay Mohammed's mouth in Arabic. Then it came out of Ahmed, my translator's mouth in quite bad English. And then it went on to my uh, word processor or whatever it's called, Microsoft Word, uh, onto my computer in English. And I tried to sort of polish it. But but the story is faithful to the spirit of the story. But probably what a bit like what what you do, Amy. Every performance is different, and every performance hopefully enhances the germ of the idea. So it it does. It, I hope that I've em, embellished it in a good way. But um, well, let's let's hear it. Okay. Uh, so this is the Red Lantern by Moulay Mohammed El Jabri. A long time ago in Marrakesh, there lived a poor, lowly sweet seller called Kadur. He was not a very successful sweet seller, and with each passing day, he lost money and became poorer. Finally, the time came when he could not afford to buy the honey that he needed to make his sweets, but he was too ashamed to take up begging. I shall leave Marrakesh, he said to himself, and cross the Atlas Mountains. Perhaps I shall have better luck in another place. So Kadur set out on his journey, carrying the only thing he owned in the world. It was a small lantern of the kind that they make in Marrakesh, fashioned out of tin and red glass. For many days, Kadur walked over the snowy passes of the Atlas Mountains, surviving on the hospital hospitality of local Berber people. At last, he descended from the great mountain range and journeyed for several more days across a vast arid desert until he stumbled upon a lush green valley where he spotted a great city with its minarets glinting from afar in the sunlight, which no traveller had ever described. Kadur approached the gates of the city with trepidation. There he came across some men who were talking in the market and he broke into conversation with them. They were astonished to hear his strange dialect 
and to discover that he was a stranger because no outsider had, had ever visited their city. They took the sweet seller to see the Pasha, that's the governor, who invited him in as a guest in his own house. It was the richest building Kadur had ever seen. Piles of precious stones lay casually on the carpets of its chambers, and even the most humdrum objects seemed to be made of gold. For three days, as required by the Quran, the Pasha showered Kadur with great kindness and hospitality. But after three of the most amazing days of his life, the time came for the sweet seller to leave. He was very troubled. He could not leave such a kind host without making him a present. And the only thing he had to give in return was his little lantern made of tin and red glass. Still, he hoped the Pasha would see that this was all he owned and accept the gift in the spirit it was intended. So before taking his leave, he plucked up all his courage and presented the Pasha with the little lantern. The Pasha took the object in his hands and looked confused. There was silence in the house. Kadur was worried that he had caused offence. But then to his great amazement, the Pasha examined the little lantern with a look of wonder and delight. He could not take his eyes off the object. Now in this city, there was no glass. No one had ever heard of glass there. The houses had slits for windows and the people drank from metal cups. To see the light of a, a, a candle shining through red glass was a miraculous sight to the Pasha. But grateful as he was for the lantern, the Pasha now also felt uncomfortable. For you cannot receive such a valuable gift without giving something of great worth in return. He didn't know how he could possibly give a present of equal value because he had nothing in his treasury but a lot of common gold, a ton or two of the usual rubies, a room full of the most ordinary emeralds, and some chests of diamonds that no one would look at twice. So how could he give this stranger a fitting return for his present? The Pasha thought for a while before deciding the only thing to do was to give almost all that he owned. So he gave Kadur 12 camel loads of gold and jewels, and he trusted, worthless as the present was, that Kadur would accept it in the spirit in which it was intended. So the Pasha arranged for the 12 camels to be loaded with the gifts, and Kadur drove the creatures back safely over the mountains to Marrakesh. When he came home, Kadur decided that his sweet selling days were over. So with his new riches, he bought himself a beautiful garden on the outskirts of Marrakesh, where he planted an orchard of almond, orange and lemon trees. The garden was scented with jasmine and echoed to the sound of cool running water and the sweet voices of nightingales. In the middle of this garden, Kadur built a magnificent mansion where he lived as a rich and very contented man. He was the envy of all the young unmarried women in Marrakesh, and he chose the prettiest and most charming girl he could find. Now, Kadur had a brother called Said, who was also a shopkeeper and who had grown prosperous at the time that Kadur had become poor. But instead of helping Kadur in his time of crisis, Said did not even acknowledge him as his brother. However, now that Kadur was wealthy, Said suddenly remembered their brotherly relationship. Said went to visit Kadur, who welcomed his sibling into his new home with generosity. Despite complimenting his brother on the new house and dropping many hints, Said could not discover the source of these new riches. Eventually, he lost patience and asked him straight out how he had amassed this wealth. Now, Kadur was a simple soul who trusted everyone and never suffered from jealousy. So he told Said the whole story from beginning to end. Why things had turned out the way they did was a mystery to Kadur. He could not understand why the Pasha had given him such precious gifts. It had not occurred to him that the Pasha considered the lantern to be of such value. But since the Pasha had presented him with these gifts, he accepted what Allah had decreed and did not worry very much about it. But when Said heard this story, he was even more astonished than his brother had been and began to obsess about it all day and all night. What happened to Kadur will surely happen to me, Said thought, if they gave my brother all that wealth for a silly little red lantern. What will they give me in exchange for gifts of great price? 
So Saeed uh, amassed all the merchandise he could think of. He sold his house, and with the money from the sale, he bought even more merchandise. He bought several mules and loaded them up with the goods. The poor beast strained and buckled under the weight. Saeed then set off over the mountains by the route that his brother had carefully described. Now, vicious bandits live in those mountains, but as it happened when Kadur had walked through them, he had been protected by his poverty, because there's no better shield against robbery than that. And coming back with his camels laden with treasure, he had been protected by the will of Allah. But scarcely had Saeed travelled for more than a few days when robbers set upon him. They seized his mules and their precious cargo, beat him brutally and left him for dead under a tree. When he regained consciousness, Saeed found himself as poor as his brother Kadur had once been. But his shame prevented him from turning back into the treacherous bandit-ridden mountain passes, so he hurried on as fast as he could until at last he came to the same lush valley as his brother had done before him. When Saeed arrived in the city, he was taken to the Pasha's house and treated as hospitably as his brother had been. Beautiful female servants anointed his wounds with soothing medicinal oils. Musicians played soft tunes that eased his troubled mind. He was seated on embroidered cushions, fed the finest food and looked after with enormous kindness. But when, after three days, the time came for Saeed to leave, he bitterly regretted the loss of all the magnificent gifts which he had intended to give the Pasha. Of all his possessions, the only thing he had left was his watch, which was old, damaged, and made of brass. But his brother had only given a red lantern, so Saeed thought he'd try his luck. He took a deep breath, and presented the watch to the Pasha. Now Said was very lucky because watches, like glass, had never been heard of in this city. The Pasha stared at the watch with a sense of wonder, as if he was gazing at the stars for the very first time, for he valued this watch far more than all those mule loads of merchandise which the robbers had seized. In fact, he prized it so much that he had to rack his brains to think of an adequate present to give him in return, a treasure which would not leave him in shame or debt to the stranger. He had, of course, some gold and jewels left, but what were they worth compared with such a gift? The only treasure he had left that was fit to exchange for the watch was the great gift that the previous stranger had given him, the Red Lantern. So with deep regret, the Pasha ordered Kadur's red glass lantern to be brought out from a cabinet on a velvet cushion where it had rested in the strongest vault in the whole treasury and presented it to Saeed. So with that lantern, Saeed set out again for Marrakesh and on this return journey, the robbers saw no reason to trouble him. Fantastic. And um, it's, I don't think it's dark enough to really be able to see it properly, but uh, mm. yeah, here's, here's my my Moroccan lantern, just a cheap tin one from from the uh, from the square in Marrakesh. Oh, lovely! <laughs> did you get that on the recent Marrakesh Storytelling Festival? I did, I did. I bought that in the square, not far from the storytelling tent. And um, perfect, lovely. It's, well, it's a very Moroccan lantern. And a very, it's a very Moroccan story. It's a great example of a Moroccan story it's just got that that rhythm and that heart to it thank you every th there's a lot of love on the chat everybody's liking that story it's a great Good. story Good. <laughs> and but it's just kind of we've I feel like we've missed kind of the heart of your story really because right you skipped that bit so there's you in a rush your batteries are going flat you're going god but you know got quite a good story to send in um and just thinking kind of about about that and absolutely the radio being your focus to this bit where and and here's the book I've written of Moroccan stories. <laughs> and um <laughs> so and I hadn't realized I thought you'd been gathering material for that really while you were out there as foreign correspondent, but you went back. You were inspired by stories to go back. So so why? Why did you 
who, you know, you finally got this, you finally got into the role that you want to be with the BBC, you know, going out as a foreign correspondent, you're covering all sorts of things. And um, and yet you go back to write this a book of Moroccan stories or to collect Moroccan stories. You've already done your piece and uh, and hadn't, you know, excited that storytelling happened, but it hadn't hadn't really taken hold of you in that first moment. So when did that happen? Why did you want to write a book? Um, I'm not really sure. <laughs> uh, on on the sort of factual level, what happened was uh, re- re- we recorded the interview. I did a piece for uh, it was for the radio about the endangered art of storytelling. Then I did uh, a TV piece about it as well, and a documentary, a half hour radio documentary, and. I was still in Morocco at the time, so I was still in journo mode. And it was Ahmed, again, my translator. He's like the sort of facilitator. I think he sort of opened the door. I don't, I didn't sort of realise this at the time. But he said when we were, after, you know, after recording the story with Moulay Mohammed, he said, why don't you write a book about, you know, why don't you, yeah, write a book about storytelling and I said oh oh, no 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 you know well uh, you know I came up with lots of excuses and then I thought actually that's not such a bad idea and he's quite imaginative Ahmed and he said what you could do is you could have a photography book like a coffee table book and each chapter is a story and then the front uh, page of that chapter is a door because Moroccan, you probably noticed, Amy, but apart from lanterns, Moroccans have lovely doors. Uh, so Marrakesh, I mean, a lot of the houses look quite tatty on the outside, but then you open the door and you go into this Riyadh. Uh, and which there's is no like way of port- knowing how no, big exactly, exactly. the place that you're going into is because yeah. there's a pool and there's a door and it could be a tiny yeah. little hovel or it could yeah. be like a palace. Yeah, exactly. So the, Ahmed's original idea, and he gets all the credit for this, uh, was it was a coffee table book, a photography book, and each chapter would have a door uh, on, on it. And then you, uh, you, you turn over the page and you get into the story. And it might even be the story of the family that lived in that Riyadh or house. So this was his rather ambitious idea and then I had a friend who's a professional photographer and so when I was coming to the end of my time as a correspondent in Morocco but I still had my job to go back to in the BBC in London which I still do so I haven't sort of abandoned journalism and become a a full-time writer or a full-time storyteller I'm still sort of primarily a journalist you know writing about Africa or whatever in for the world service um but so I said to my photographer friend, what about you and me work together? You take the photos. I'll write the stories. I'll collect stories from Marrakesh. You come out to Marrakesh and we'll take some portraits of storytellers. Uh, we'll, we'll photograph doors. And, and we did this and we put it together. And I, w- I went to as many publishers as I could. And none of them bit. They, they were too worried about the cost because when you when you're producing a coffee table book with high quality resolution images etc cetera, etc cetera, the print run is expensive and all the rest of it so i couldn't get they might still i might still i haven't ruled it out in the future someone might come along and say that's a great idea you know one of these art uh publishers might say this is a great idea so anyway uh through to lucy weird... wood sorry yeah exactly it's got to lucy wood yeah So uh, by coincidence, a friend of mine uh, who lives in Casablanca, his aunt had written, she was a collector of stories. She'd written a book called Tales from the Bazaars of Arabia. And each chapter was a different country in the Arab world, except Morocco. And my friend Tahir, Tahir Shah, who's written a book called The Caliph's House, and he's a great storyteller himself. Uh, So I read this book, Tales from the Bazaars of Arabia. I contacted the uh, publishers of of this one and I said, this is a lovely book. Would you be interested in a similar book about Moroccan stories? And they said, yeah, that'd be great. 
And then I said, can we have photos? And they went, oh, well, it would cost too much and the print run and we're a small publisher and blah, blah, blah. So then I had to go back to my photographer and go, uh, the thing is, they really love the book, but they don't want any photos. And he's like, oh, what the hell, you know? So he wasn't best chuffed about that. But as I say, maybe in the future, we could produce a wonderful book of Moroccan stories with portraits and, and stuff like that. So that's sort of that's how uh, the book came about. It was a suggestion from Ahmed, and then I came back to research it while still doing my job, my nine to five in London. It would be beautiful to to have portraits of all the storytellers because I think you have really tried to honour them in the bit, but to be able to to see their images and their faces, and. For me, I don't think you've told us yet what the heart of that book is. And I think it's maybe because you know some of the people here and you assume that everybody knows. Apart from there was one word that you mentioned, which was endangered. Because we've been talking about it. You were talking about all these storytellers and the being the square and there being quite a lot of storytellers that you could record. But they were all of a certain age, weren't they? I mean, and that, that was the key thing was that if you were going to do it, it had to be done then. Yeah, so one one of the uh, reviews or, you know, you go around and you say, can you write something nice about my book? And I contacted sort of everyone I knew. And any, I, I haven't got it. Anyway, he said he's performed. I've got it here. Uh, Richard Hamilton has not only offered entertainment to his readers, but he has also carried out a valuable form of rescue archaeology within the vanishing world of professional storytelling. So you're right. I, I think that was maybe the missing, the, the thing that I forgot to say, that, you know, when, when I did this re first report, it was about endangered stories. And then when I was interviewing and recording storytellers in Marrakesh, there were only like six still left, and most of them had retired. And then by the time the book was published, which was 2011, about three of them had died. And they were, in fact, they'd all retired. And so there were only a couple left. And but I can get on to the more positive thing. But maybe we can talk about that later. There's sort of efforts to revive storytelling. Because at Morocco. that moment, I mean, when we were talking before, you just were in the right place at the right time because actually there wasn't anybody in Morocco who wanted to learn those stories. I think, um, and I don't, I, I wasn't there, but I mean, my feeling was that kind of, it was just on that cusp of kind of wanting to be more, more Western and, and wanting to embrace technology and kind of, you know, there was a pushing away of, of the old ways and, and kind of who's got time to sort of sit around in the square and, yeah. and the, and the feeling of the square changing, um, and so you talked about Gemma Elfenar before, and Gemma Elfenar is it, that, that is sort of the it is the heart of, of Marrakesh, which is what you were saying, tales from the heart of Morocco. That's the square that sort of was on the trade route that Marrakesh built up around. It was the place where people stopped, where they had somewhere to sleep, something to drink, and they had entertainment. And the entertainment was stories, and that was how it had been for years and years and years. And then there's you were there just to see that that tipping point of just kind of, you know, all of the other things coming into the square and much louder music. And like you were saying, there was just half a dozen people. Yeah. And, and I other. think the young people were suffering from the same sort of mentality that when I was interviewing the storyteller, I was distracted by my batteries running low, the mini disc running out of space, uh, all sorts of perceived demons in my head about would my bosses like this piece or whatever you know I was distracted I wasn't able to immerse myself in that experience and a lot of young Moroccans at the time were also they wanted to listen to rap music and go to this was the era of internet cafe so it was slightly before everyone had a phone so people would go and uh go on to Skype and talk to their friends in Dubai or whatever or and it was also so this was early to to that around 2006 2007 around then so uh people were watching dvds they were watching uh satellite tv the moroccan government decided to give give everyone a free satellite dish which is odd but so when you look at the rooftops of marrakesh you've got all the dreamy uh mosque 
uh, minarets and all the rest of it. And then you've got these little dishes everywhere, which is slightly bizarre. But anyway, uh, so there was this move to modernize and Morocco likes to see itself as Western, not necessarily African. They're slightly snooty about sub-Saharan Africans. They like to think of themselves as more Middle East and more European progressive. They've got a young king. They want to look to Europe. They've tried to join the EU, which sounds bizarre, but and they've tried to dig a tunnel between Morocco Australia and Australia made Spain. it more efficient, you know. Yes, anything, anything possible, yeah. So you're right, Morocco wanted to be modern and they weren't interested in looking back at these old men that were telling these ancient tales from the ancestors. So uh, people were looking, they were distracted, you know, they wanted quick a quick fix. And they didn't want to sit and listen. So in the old days, it might take a year to tell a story. And these storytellers had amazing memories. So people would sit down for an hour after work or before they got the bus back to their village. They'd sit down and the storyteller would tell a tiny little fragment of a very long epic. And But he made it deliberately he'd come to a cliffhanger just before he'd say and then the princess it was time to decide whether she should marry the beggar but I'll tell you what happened tomorrow <laughs> and then uh, the people go oh no and then people would miss their bus or something or anyway they'd come back tomorrow and then he'd pick up the story so but in 2007 or whatever people just wanted to talk to their friends in Dubai or something, you know, or um, watch a Brazilian soap opera or, um, you know, go on Facebook. So, um, you know, things were changing. And that's the thing, because I think, you know, sort of that idea of of a Westerner coming and recording stories from another tradition can be a little bit tricky. And it and it does depend where the heart is coming from. And if there's just a, I'm going to go and find that because all the material is already made and all I've got to do is kind of write it up and I can sell it back at home is one way of approaching it. But actually there was a moment and you were saying about talking to Ahmed and I'm asking you to do it because it was, if it wasn't collected then, it was when, you know, those people were dying while you were there and they were just going one by one and these, you know, just vast archives of knowledge were being lost. Um, with no young people wanting to come and and learn and it not being seen as a as a particularly respectable job I mean certainly not for women um, and even for men it was just it wasn't wasn't very high on the social scale no, <laughs> I no, think. definitely so, not um, and there's a saying that when a storyteller dies a library burns and I suppose I wanted to try and save that library but I didn't I didn't have this messianic uh, white man saviour thing that I wanted. And it's funny, on on the invite for the Zoom, you've got me wearing a like a kaftan and a fez hat and stuff. And just, just to explain, th- this was part of the procession of the Marrakesh Storytelling Festival, where they encouraged people to dress up and make it as colourful as possible and then follow the storytellers and the musicians into the square. I'm not some sort of weird guy that dresses up in Moroccan gear. You know, what's it called? Cultural appropriation. I'm not I'm not into that. And I'm not, neither am I some sort of anthropologist, you know, because I know exactly what you mean. And some Moroccans have said to me, well, why does it take an outsider to save our tradition? And I say, well, I don't know. I mean, maybe I just saw that it was valuable and maybe Moroccans are too close up. It's a bit like when I see tourists in London, they're wide-eyed at uh, Big Ben or something. And I think Big Ben, who gives a toss, you know. So sometimes the outsider sees things afresh and appreciates them the things that the locals take for granted. So I think not only was the young generation distracted, but Moroccans, it's like a fish looking for water or something. Moroccans didn't notice storytelling. And also it it was dying out very gradually. So one of the things I say in the book that, you know, this thing about a library burning, if someone went into the British library and set fire to it, people would go, oh, my God, this is rolling news. But if you've just got this gradual erosion of storytelling going, happening 
over you know generations as television comes in as the nuclear family disperses as modernity comes in you know then you don't even notice it until it's gone so it was a, a, a process of gradual erosion it wasn't uh it didn't happen overnight so I, it's kind of you to say that I was there at the right time but I think I think this was a well it was the right time a also, process yeah but also as you say I think the right mentality and that is where your mm. your role as a journalist and the outside eye really figures I mean it's I think it's really good that you told the story of the Red Lantern because it's absolutely ideal of an ideal story to show because it is it's kind of Red lanterns are so common that they're just worth nothing and then gold is, is so common it's worth nothing and it's only when things become rare and it's suddenly not common anymore that you suddenly appreciate the value of it when it's just like when the, you know there's gold lying around on the ground everywhere if the stories every time you go in and out of the shop you don't even notice that they're there um and it's only once that the scarcity comes that it's in like oh you realize what what you do, do you remember that tv series called tales of the Unex tales of the unexpected mm. yeah who was that um rolled oh, up yeah and that they're it's <laughs> Anyway, I remember there was a story about a man, that, a man that had the two most expensive bottles of wine in the world because there were only two left. And at the end of the story, he pours one of, to, to, much to the horror of the collectors and the people around him, he pours one of the bottles onto the carpet. But by doing that, the, the remaining bottle becomes even more valuable. Yeah. People are weird, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, oh, there's so many different ways we could go here, and I'm aware that um, I have promised to do a Q and A at the end, and I've still got a list of questions that I want to uh, ask. Okay. Um, so I, I think it's worth because we don't want to leave it at that point, really. Of, um, of now, all the storytellers have gone, and you can read this book, and that is it for the storytelling tradition in Morocco, um, because that isn't what has happened and I I don't know quite when the turning moment was um but tell us tell us what's happened since you wrote that book yeah so lo lots of amazing things really so uh one of the storytellers was called Abdur Rahim and I and his nickname's Azalea and again the Azalea story goes on it's said that if you by the time you reach the end of the story you will have gone blind and because he had such an amazing memory and this Azalea story would go on for like a year and he could remember all of it word for word. And it's pre-Arab era. Um, he was called Azalea. So anyway, I interviewed him as well and recorded some of his stories. And he also featured in my BBC TV thing. And then a German filmmaker made a documentary about him and he had a, and it was about him and his son and how his son wanted to be a storyteller. And so after the book came out, um, I said, I met Abdur Rahim again and I gave him a copy of the book. And I said, oh, there's this great place just started up in Marrakesh by a British, it's run by a British guy called Mike Richardson and it's called Cafe Clock. And you should go there and perform because basically this cafe it was really ahead of its time it was selling sort of vegan food uh alternative food milkshakes and it was popular with young moroccans popular with sort of trendy uh travelers peace corps people and anyway they had that once a night uh, once a week they'd have a storytelling night and they would have young moroccans telling in arabic and then uh, doing versions in English, they'd invite. It was a bit like a sort of open mic thing. It, so, so uh, all comers could come and tell tales, and and this gathered a bit of momentum. So I said to Abdur Rahim, uh, "Why don't you go along there?" Because he said, "Oh, you know, uh, I can't make any money in the square. It's too noisy. Uh, I'm only. I, I can't afford to look after my family." And he also said that after this documentary, his son had sort of gone a bit uh do lally because the son was under the mistaken impression that he was going to be leonardo dicaprio now that he'd appeared in a obscure german documentary uh that, that then the hollywood was going to come calling and then when it didn't happen 
his son sort of suffered a bit of a mental breakdown and was very depressed and didn't want to leave his room. And he was only like 15 or something. So I, I was hearing all this from Abdur Rahim via Ahmed, the interpreter. So I said, well, look, uh, go go to Cafe Clock. Uh, they'll, they'll welcome you with open arms. You're a famous storyteller. You, this can be a chance for your next chapter. And also I'll see what I can do. Uh, to uh, to help you. So this uh, this book, I'd sent it weirdly. This is another sort of story that you couldn't make up, but it's not a traditional story. It's a, a modern story and it happened to me. I sent the book to the royal palace to see if the king would like it. And a couple of weeks, no, a couple of months later, I got a phone call and they said, are you going to be in tomorrow or Tuesday or something? And I said, no, I'm at work. Uh, but my wife's in, she's not working that day. She'll open the door. And they said, no, no, it's got to be you. So I was like, okay, well, uh, looking at my diary, I'm I'm free next Thursday, you know. So sure enough, next Thursday comes, there's a ring on the bell. There's a man in dark glasses. There's a limo outside. The man, and I still don't know what's going on because the phone call had no, it said ID withheld. And, and so this man in dark glasses and the limo, whatever, hands me this parcel and says, sign for this. So, are you Richard Hamilton? Yeah, sign for this. I open it up. It's a letter from King Mohammed VI of Morocco saying, congratulations on your wonderful book. So I couldn't believe this. So And half of it, uh, well, there's one side in Arabic and one side in English. And the English one says, congratulations. I And I hope the Arab one says congratulations it might say you're <laughs> an never set foot in my country again you western you know whatever but anyway so i'd said to this is a bit of a long story but when i when i said to abdurahim i'll try and help you out i thought i'll write to the king again you know in for a penny in for a pound so i managed to get the address for the like the royal palace head of protocol and everything and said, you know, I've collected, you know, you very kindly uh, wrote a letter about my book. I'm trying to encourage storytelling and preserve it. And one of the great storytellers is really suffering. His son's not well, he's not making any money. Could you maybe help him or create a space for storytellers? And then um, nothing happened, but I went back, you know, a few months later and I met Abdur Rahim and he said, oh, yeah, I'm going to the cafe clock and it's all great. And he said, the other great thing is that the king, uh, I, I got the letter, sorry, the king got your letter at asking and he's bought me a house. Wow. <laughs> so uh, you couldn't make that up. So the king ends up buying the storyteller a house. And then all these other people were going, oh, my dad's a storyteller. Can you, can you write to the king? <laughs> And I was like, I can't write to the king anymore. You know, I, I burnt my bridges. I've, 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 you know, I've abused my little network that I have. I better stop now. But anyway, so that things developed from there. The cafe clock, uh, and then a shout out to Mike and Lucy Wood. They built uh, built a cafe called the World Storytelling Cafe, and then they had a storytelling festival which started last year, and a very successful one, even bigger one after COVID. And of in- course, the patron is now the king. Yeah, so it's all come full circle, and I must—I would never have imagined this because when I wrote the book, I was—it was called the Last Storytellers for a reason because I thought they're dying out. You know, uh, I've got to record them. I've got to save them got to save these stories for posterity and young people aren't interested and now there's been a complete turnaround and lots of young Moroccans think it's really cool to get in storytelling and they're the hope for the future they're the next generation and they're involved in the storytelling and you've seen it yourself Amy and you've been to the square and you we had a continuous readathon and storytelling session 54 hours or something you know so it's amazing I could never have predicted the enthusiasm and the, the way things are going. It's just such a, a wonderful good news story of just the number of um, of young Moroccan storytellers there are now. And and a lot of them are women, which is just a huge turnaround. I mean, there's always has been women storytellers, but more indoors rather than certainly not in the square. And um and I'd and I'd love to carry on talking talking about that, but but I've also got I'm just really interested in you as well, kind of just bring it back to that thing about journalism and, and broadcasting and you know kind of that, that stepping between worlds so I'm going to ask you another question in a minute but I'm just 
we are nearing the end sadly so I did promise people if you have got questions that you want to ask Richard Hamilton this is the time now to put them in the Q&A there's a little Q&A button down here um get them in quick before I take up all of the time uh because I do have a habit of doing that <laughs> so it's amazingly good news story in Morocco and it I just I wonder because um you've you've been on this whole journey from this sort of new sort of quite ambitious young journalist looking for the story and really kind of wanting to make your mark wanting to make your your way in the in the world service which you're still doing and there's a bit of me that kind of wonders if um if the other journalists you know kind of they're all into war zones and politics doing proper serious stories and and what they think of you kind of going off and, and, and talking to storytellers and seeing if that's proper journalism and what they think about it all. I'm not sure. I mean, I don't, I'm not that famous or anything. I don't think they go around going, oh, that's that Moroccan storytelling guy. I think some people think it's cool and some people think it's a bit odd. And I've never been someone that wants to stand there with a flak jacket in Ukraine or you know, Mogadishu or somewhere being shot at. I mean, no, I don't think. <laughs> I did I did maybe at one stage think it would be cool to be like a John Simpson or a Jeremy Bowen, but on the whole, I like doing cultural things. I like doing documentaries. I like doing features. And storytelling's helped my journalism. And as I said, it wasn't until afterwards that I realised that we are storytellers and we're all natural storytellers. So when I... When I've trained young pe journalists at the BBC, I've told them to tell stories. And I say it's not about assembling a bunch of information and then listing a whole lot of facts. You're not a reporter. You are a storyteller. And that is something, you know, we even children, well, not, not even, but especially children, will tell great stories because they we naturally know how to build up suspense. You don't tell the punchline at, at the beginning. You naturally know about sort of rhythm and suspense and surprise and twists. And so storytelling, in a way, is something that we all do. But, of course, when journalists think, oh, I've just got to report a whole bunch of facts, but that's that's quite boring. So I think it's improved my journalism and I hope I've been able to instill that in in younger journalists as well and and it's given me confidence as well so it because I've spoken at festivals and in front of bigger audience and and then also telling some I, I think I said this before we turned the microphone on when we were having a brief chat uh, I first told stories to a friend of mine from this book to a friend of mine whose children at the time were about five and seven. And so my friend said, oh, why don't you come round and tell the stories at bedtime? And that it was a powerful experience, probably just as much as sitting in the square for the first time. This is the first time that I was reading the stories aloud orally to an audience, even though it was two kids under the duvet. But they loved it. And they I could hear these giggles and gurgles from the duvet. And you know, so I got that how I suppose that was my first experience of being an oral storyteller as opposed to just writing it or just being a, a journalist. So I think storytelling has enhanced my journalistic abilities. And now I see it's like I, we're talking about things coming full circle. It's nice when the stories that have been on the page are read aloud you know and performed because as much as it's great to have a book and that that to be a process of saving something getting it down on paper to, to bring things alive it's better to to tell them and and how yeah it, it must be really amazing as well now when you start to hear storytellers again telling those stories back to you that they've learned from your book and you've been a link in that chain yeah i mean i don't want to again i don't want to claim too much uh importance but like with the festival there were young Moroccan storytellers saying oh I love the Red Lantern or I love the King and the Prime Minister I love the birth of the Sahara and they would tell it so it's immense but they're not I don't see them as my stories I was just a conduit yeah. that helped pass them on you know I'm just a vehicle for these 
they don't belong to anyone. They, no one's got copyright on them. No, no, but but be, that's it though. That being a link, being a part of that process. Mm. And um, Despina's uh, put up a question. And um, have you considered writing a new book called The New Storytellers? <laughs> oh, that's a good idea. It's a great no, I, idea. I haven't, but I'm I open to new ideas. Uh, no, but it is very heartening to see the young generation uh, and their enthusiasm. And I think I, again, just as I was too impatient when I was recording the first story, I think I was too pessimistic. Because, because these old guys were dying, I had assumed wrongly that storytelling was dying out, but it seems to have miraculously come round again. Just, yeah. And uh, yeah, Jane's saying it is, it's a great story with such a happy ending. Um, and and Leanne's just asking, which might be a nice question to finish with as well, is what stories made the biggest impact on your appreciation of storytelling? Oh, gosh. So there's the, uh, the, just very briefly, there's this one called The King and the Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister always says it's good, no matter what. Do you know, what, it's ve- it is very short. It's very short. And I know we've gone a little bit over. And if people need to go, you know, it's fine. Mm-hmm. And it'll be a recording. You catch up later. Do you want to, it would be great if we finished with that story. All right, okay. And what I like... We'll talk about it at the end. Yeah, we'll talk about it at the end, okay. Um, So bear with me. I think it's sort of the one that has the most impact. I mean, I love the Red Lantern, but the King and the Prime Minister is something that grows on me and and it has more... It's quite philosophical, even though you wouldn't expect, you know, it seems on the surface, quite simple, but I think it's got lots of layers to it. Uh, so this is by Abdurrahim, who's the one whose son, you know, had a meltdown and then the king bought him a house. The king and his prime minister. There was once a king who had a prime minister who was called It's Good. They gave him this name because no matter what the king said, the minister always remarked, it's good. One day, the prime minister met the king in the garden of his great palace where he found him idly chopping a small strip of bamboo with his dagger. The dagger slipped on the bamboo and the monarch sliced a piece of his finger off. It's good, the prime minister exclaimed. The sovereign wrapped a bandage around his finger, but he did not think it was good at all. In fact, he was so angry that he ordered the politician to be locked up in prison and left there to rot. Some days later, the king wanted to get away from all his problems and the endless intrigue in the palace. He decided to make a voyage by sea, so he boarded a ship and sailed away. After many days on the ocean waves, the vessel came to an island. When the king arrived there, he thought it was a beautiful place, and he disembarked on his own. But no sooner had he left the boat than he met some natives, who warned him that on this island strangers are always captured and sacrificed at dawn the next day. Before the king even had time to think about this, he saw a group of fierce-looking soldiers running towards him. They chased the king, caught him, and brought him to the high priest. Now it was the tradition on the island that before they killed anyone, the high priest would check if he would make a good sacrifice. So the soldiers took off the king's clothes to see whether anything was missing, because you cannot sacrifice a body which is not complete. When they brought the naked king to him, the high priest noticed that a part of his finger had been chopped off. And when the priest saw this and how the finger had been disfigured, he said, stop, this man cannot be sacrificed. Give him his horse, his weapons, his clothes and let him go. So the king hurriedly went back to his ship and left the island. As he was sailing back, he began to think about the prime minister who was still in jail and remembered what he'd said. The king thought to himself, oh, he was right after all. When he said it's good that I cut my finger, he knew what he was talking about. If I had not cut it, I would have been sacrificed. When the king came home, he freed the prime minister and told him all about his ordeal on the island. He asked the prime minister, how was your time in jail? The prime minister said, it's good. The king was amazed and asked, how, how can it how can, how can it have been good? Well, thank God you put me in prison, replied the Prime Minister. If you'd taken me to the island with you, you would have escaped, but I would have been sacrificed. 
Marvellous. <laughs> I love that story. So I think that was the one that these uh, the, the the kids in the duvet loved, you know, and it works for for kids and it works for older people. And that's the one I I heard you tell it in 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 Marrakesh, and um and then I ended up in a jewelry shop, kind of drinking mint tea as you do, and kind of telling stories in the jewelry shop, and the and I told a story, and uh, and the jewelry sort of seller. I like, tell him, tell me a story. He's like, oh, not really a storyteller. I'm not really a storyteller. Like, oh, go on. And that was the one that he remembered. That was the one that he told me back. Amazing. And, uh, yeah, it was great. And just sort of, you know, watching the different versions traveling around is fantastic. I uh, think so what, what, I, what I like about it is that people have come up to me afterwards and said, oh, that story is about uh, fate you know or other people say it's a moral about imperfection and that it's all right to be human all right that you're not 100 percent. you know there's something wrong with you but that turns out to be your savior and then I came across this uh, poem by Rumi the Sufi sort of mystic from Central Asia who said in the mind in the mind of men things are good good or bad but in the mind of God everything is good and I thought that that's amazing. That could have been written about the story. And then e even every, almost every time I tell it, people say, oh, that reminds me of Nasruddin. You know, there's a wise fool who seems a bit of a fool, but actually he's very, he says very uh, philosophically deep things. <laughs> you know, so there's so many layers to it. That's what I like. And then Ahmed, who was the translator, said, no, it's about sacrifice and it's a parable like, uh, I think it, is it Moses or Abraham sacrifices his son Isaac and then the festival of Eid where you 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 sacrifice a goat or, or or the lamb or you know whatever sorry I'm not an expert on Islam but you know that he said there's lots of religious lines going through and that hadn't occurred to me at all you know and I, so there's so many different interpretations of it but uh so it, it's a story that keeps on giving and and that's the wonderful thing I think about traditional stories is they do they're kind of they look so simple and it's just they've been polished by so many people, so many tongues down to that kind of the the bare minimum and you've got all of the humour but it's such a strong narrative and it, but it's just got all of those those layers and and possibilities and openness that you can interpret it in in so many ways. It's just been. A joy, Richard. Thank you so much for, for coming and talking to us. And um, thank you. Well, and thank you for sharing the stories. And obviously, if you if you haven't figured out yet, the book is called The Last Storytellers, <laughs> and it is um, it tells the heart of Morocco. It's quite readily available. I think you can get it. Can you get it directly from you? Yeah, um, yeah. If you want to, I'm can I can send. I mean, you can get it in a bookshop. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Kindle, but if you don't want to make Jeff Bezos richer and you want to make me richer, I can send you. A, I can send people signed copies. Uh, so there's a paperback as uh, Kindle. Yeah, it's, it's it's available in all the usual ways. So maybe if you, we can make a way to make my email available to people. I can send copies off. Definitely. Well, or, you, can... you know, when I go to a storytelling festival, I bring like twenty books in a suitcase Maybe. so if you just book richard and then he'll come and then you can buy a copy when when he come yeah. or you go to your website which is just richard-hamilton.com yeah. and i think you can you can message you and contact you through your website yeah. uh if you forget all the other things you can always just come to me and i will always yeah. pass things on and what we haven't had a chance to talk about is the house of stories um and when you started that and the inspiration behind all of that so we'll just maybe have to get you to come back but you do have an amazing archive of stories and storytellers from not just from Morocco but around the world um that is uh, on YouTube at the House of Stories home so go and find that and I will put these links on the YouTube in the in the notes um and and up on my Facebook page so thank you so much, Mary Leslie. Saying, are you going to be at Fate? I don't think you're going to be at Festival of the Edge, sadly, are you? No. When when's that? What's Sorry. This year, uh, it's the third weekend in July. Oh, no, right. Mary. Why don't you put it down on your recommendations at the end of the festival and your suggestions in the comment box for next year? <laughs> Do that, and then maybe maybe Richard will be at Festival. Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to come to more of these things. It's just difficult juggling everything, but I'd like I'd like to come to more festivals and. 
tell stories definitely well we will have to make those things happen but for now um that is the end of tonight uh if you've enjoyed tonight there's lots more episodes of taking the tradition on that you can find on my youtube channel um please do subscribe um if you want to become a patron you can do that you can follow me on facebook and instagram and all the usual social media things um and i will be back on the first tuesday in july which will be tuesday the 4th of july with the last in this series, um, because take August off, um, but we have one more um, before we finish. And um, my patrons always get to know first, and I only put it up today, so I can't tell everybody else. If you want to know, you have to become a patron, Um, but it will be up on my Facebook page quite soon. But I will tell you that she is quite a special person, and you will be very excited to see her. Uh, Thank you for all the lovely comments in the chat. It's been fantastic to have you, all your company tonight. Um, and thank you for coming and finding us. If you're watching it later, um, you're welcome to watch any time of the day and night. It's always nice to catch up with you. So for now, just once again, put your hands together with a great big whoop, whoop, whoop for the marvellous Richard Hamilton. <laughs>